Good morning. Good morning. Welcome or welcome back to Bookie Monsters. My name is PK. It is Monday, April the 8th. Eclipse Day. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you had a good weekend. Kim says, good morning, all. Mary, good morning, PK and everyone. Happy Solar Eclipse Day. Indeed. Mary, hi, Kim. How are you feeling today? Ready for the eclipse? We will probably not see it. Not only is it, uh, we're not in its path per se, we won't see the full thing, uh, but it's also overcast. It has been for all weekend and I don't think it's supposed to clear up until tomorrow. So we probably won't get to see anything. But did you see that how many planets are supposed to be aligned during it? Very cool. Whoever's born during these hours is going to have an interesting chart for sure. Did you read good things? I didn't read very much this weekend. I binge watched uh, season five of The Rookie a lot um, and did some crocheting and slept some yesterday. So yeah, it was a good weekend. Ready to, I guess I'm ready to jump in and do things like payroll today. You, you'll see some of it, about two minutes of it max. Yeah, it's a very cool phenomenon. Good morning, Deborah. Up early today. Doctor appointment. Sad for doctor appointment. Glad you're here. Well, let's jump in. Uh, every day of the week, we look at a new genre that is being released into the wild this week. New releases each day, a different genre. On Mondays, we look at cozy mysteries. On Tuesdays, we look at mysteries and thrillers. Wednesdays, we look at romance. Thursdays, we look at fantasy and science fiction. And Friday is Freeform Friday, so we just look at whatever we want to. And quite often, it's a more cozy mysteries because there's always a lot of them. Let me get rid of the banner. So consider this your morning news. We started the 620 Man by Baldacci. So far, I love it. Well, Dodgy's good. Very Deadly Delights by Kathleen Suzette. Uh, eighth in series of cookies, creamery mystery. Kindle Unlimited. Just cross the 100 page mark. And yeah, I need to eat that for breakfast. Uh, it says, summer is my favorite time of year. The sand and surf, sunny days, and clear starry nights make it a deliciously wonderful time of year. It's the dead tourists that bring me down. I think it's just tourists in general. Nestled amongst the lovely lilac bushes and the gentle lap of waves against the shore, Lilac Bay has always been a slice of paradise for its residents, including lifelong friends Maddie and Chloe. That is, until the tranquility of their seaside haven is shattered by a discovery that sends shockwaves through the community. A vacationing young woman found dead on the pristine sands of their peaceful beach. What seems like an accident at first glance is soon unveiled as a meticulously plotted murder, turning the serene Lilac Bay into the stage for a deadly crime. That was a good premise. Wish they could write more than 110 pages. A Body at the Dance Hall by Marty Wingate. I'm familiar with that name. Let's double check the release date. And technically it came out last week. Did we read this one? I think we did. Sorry, moving on. We have guidelines. We don't also don't do compilations like that so i guess we will jump into here these are coming out supposedly tomorrow uh apparently not this is out of print and it came out in march How about this? Oh, I was going to ask you. I'm sorry. 
Um, had another very poor show. Oh no, little foot traffic and the few that came didn't buy. Many vendors sold absolutely nothing in over five hours. I sold enough to make my table fee. Well, at least you did that, but wow. Was it just, was it the weekend? Was it not marketed? I said, how are you doing? Okay, I have to cancel my cataract surgery until I have the money. Oh no. Mary says a glorified short story, 110 pages. That's what I say. Keo's got the hiccups. Uh, Kim, I plan to sit under my carport during the eclipse. That <laughs> well, I'm wearing my uh, black tourmaline. Kim, sorry to hear about your surgery. Hope you can gather up what you need soon and get it done. Yeah, it's your eyes. Deborah, sorry, Mary, I haven't been very active in the show scene lately. I don't do them at all. Well, The Vinyl Detective, seventh in the series. Oh, I guess it's subtitled Noise Floor. This is by Andrew Cartmel. Cartmel. The Vinyl Detective plunges into the world of electronic dance music in its seventh adventure. The Vinyl Detective enters the fraught and frenzied realm of electronic dance music. Lambert Ramkin, a.k.a. Imperium Dart, techno trickster and ambient music wizard of the 1990s, has gone walkabout, discover, disappearing from his rather palatial home in Kent. This isn't the first time he's pulled a vanishing act, but he's never been gone so long before, and his wife, wives actually, it's complicated, are worried and hire the vinyl detective to find the old rascal. They theorize that wherever the missing man is, he won't be able to resist turning up at a record fair somewhere in search of a 12-inch white label acid house singles, which he collects compulsively. And no one knows the world of record fairs better than the vinyl detective. They're not wrong. But once our hero finds the wandering lamb, the trouble really begins, including terrifying, etc., with a side order of... If things break the wrong way, mass murder. Strange. To be so coarse language. The world is changing, though. A toast to murder. Kim said, I started a GoFundMe. Feels funny doing it, but several people suggested it. Can you put the link? Jebba, we're going to see about 80% of the clouds covered. All right. Yeah, I'm hearing clouds, cloud cover is going to be the issue here. Combination of things, poor advertising, in your humble opinion, and you should know. V to get in, another big craft show nearby. Oh, no, and the economy, definitely. Kim says, hospital wants 1900 I have met none of my deductible. Oh, yeah. That's going to first part of the year. Yep. Medical establishment is in complete disarray. It's all about money these days. I think we're supposed to get 85%. Happy Monday, all Annalise. Hi, Annalise. Good to see you here. Indeed. Yeah, Kim, if you want to post that link. Uh, a Toast to Murder, Elizabeth Band Craig, 24th in the Myrtle Clover Cozy Mysteries. Uncorking Secrets, One Grape at a Time. Myrtle Clover has quite a fondness for getting things for free. She So she was delighted when a former student and current winery owner invited her and a friend to a free tasting. When Myrtle and Miles visited the charming Serenity Springs Winery for a relaxing afternoon of tastings she anticipated nothing more than sipping fine vintages and enjoying the picturesque vineyards but as any seasoned sleuth knows murder occurs in the most unexpected places especially if this is your 24th one she and miles were savoring the various offerings and relaxing in front of the winery's large fireplace when they realized the guest dozing in the chair, armchair nearest them was not just napping he was out for good. Can Myrtle and Miles find the killer before more trouble ferments? I bet they do. Uh, another one by Elizabeth Van Craig. She apparently has more than one series going simultaneously. This is a new one. Uh, in the Sunset Ridge Mysteries, 
the type A guide to solving murder, a Sunset Ridge mystery book number one. Sam turns murder into her most challenging project yet. Samantha Prescott has a knack for getting things done. Whether it's organizing a bake sale, hosting a book club, or volunteering at the local animal shelter, she always has a plan and a smile. But when she and her husband move to the sleepy neighborhood of Maple Hills, she wonders if she's in over her head. Maple Hills is a chaotic mess of barking dogs, a draconian homeowners association, and an enigmatic neighbor who's more rumor than reality. Undeterred by disorder, Sam plunges headfirst into her first in her new community, armed with checklist and a determined smile. She sounds like a control freak, and if this were my neighbor, I'd say get the heck away from me. The chaos reaches a crescendo with the sudden demise of the HOA president at a seemingly idyllic neighborhood picnic. Armed with her keen organizational skills, Sam is determined to unravel the mystery behind the murder. Will Sam solve the murder, or will her meddling lead her down a perilous path, jeopardizing not only her reputation, but her life? Truly, if I had a neighbor like that... I'd do bad things. That's all I'm going to commit to. I would do bad things. Cottage on Gooseberry Bay, <clears throat> excuse me, till death. Kathy Daly, 15th in Cottage on Gooseberry Bay a series, 148 pages. USA Today bestseller, blah, blah, blah. Uh, about finding answers and fostering hope while building friendships and embracing the magic of life by the sea and small town holidays. Ainsley, Ainsley Holloway had come to Gooseberry Bay to find answers about her past. She'd come to find... She'd come to find an explanation for the dreams that haunted her after the death of the cop who'd been, who both rescued and raised her. And she'd come to identify the family she couldn't remember, but knew in her heart she'd once belonged to. Ainsley hoped that by finding these answers, she'd also find healing. She hoped she'd once, that once she'd resurrected the memories buried deep in her mind, she'd find solace. She'd find peace. Whatever. Uh, <clears throat> That's a whole lot of blah, blah, blah until we get to what this book is about. The first family of Goofs, Berry Bay, is having a wedding, and everyone who is anyone has turned out. Preparations for the big event have been going on for months, and in spite of the blood, sweat, and tears experienced by almost every merchant in town, it appears that everything will go off without a hitch until Bridezilla turns up dead. Oh, that wasted time. Meanwhile, Adam and Ainsley are exploring their new relationship status. Bexley is settling in with Remy's help. Tegan decides to move on, and Avery has a surprise announcement. Sounds like a soap opera. I will be here feeling it. Emily, how are you? I put what I think would be for both. Who was the author of A Toast for Murder? Uh, hang on, let's slide up. Uh, Elizabeth Spann Craig, 24th in the Myrtle Clover Mysteries. I'm doing fine. Excited to view the eclipse today. Won't see it completely since we aren't on the direct path, but may see some of it going over to friend's house and it will be fun. Probably get better views. I'm sure somebody's going to be covering it on TV or YouTube. Emily sounds fun. Thank you. You're welcome. Indecent Exposure by Heather Horrocks. Sixth in the Who Done Him In. <laughs> Luke Hill has everything a person could want in life. A thriving video game developing company, wealth, a beautiful fiancé, a stalker, and a murderer. After life, here he comes. Vicky continues her zany adventures, running the Who Done Him Inn, joined by twin Liz and Grandma Ross. Her black sheep of the family sister, Georgia, has an unexpected surprise that will shake up her relationship with Bear. Bear has an unexpected visitor and an impossible decision to make. And David just wants to romance Vicky, which is just fine with her. Join this endearing cast of characters for the next installment and laugh yourself to death at the Who Done Him In. I don't know. As we've mentioned before, cozy mysteries have become more 
less about solving a crime, shall we say. A Dowry of Death, 107 pages, just crossed over, by Jin Jones. While planning her wedding, Helen Binney hears about a local bride who was murdered the night before the ceremony. It happened 10 years ago before Helen moved to town and no one has ever been arrested. So, of course, Helen can't resist investigating. The prime suspect is the fiancé, but Helen can't rule out the jealous friend, the best man with divided loyalties, or even the professional rival with a long-standing grudge against the victim. Helen only has a week to identify the culprit before her wedding. She's getting close, and the killer knows it. If Helen's not careful, her groom, just like the one in the cold case, might end up with nothing but a dowry of death. And we don't do compilations. Death at the Festival by Hilary Pugh, fourth in the Breakfast Club Detectives. Accident or murder? Johnny Cardew expected a restful few days at the Reimagine the Light Festival, listening to enlightened discussions and enjoying good, wholesome food. But sleeping in a tent is not as, as relaxing as he'd hoped. And while his wife attends a session on women film directors, Johnny opts for a quieter event where a right-wing speaker reads from her latest book. Not being particularly right-wing himself, Johnny hoped to sit quietly at the back and catch up on some sleep. He hadn't bargained for an overheated tent, an aggressive heckler, and a speaker who falls off the stage unconscious, a victim of poisoning by deadly mushrooms. The Breakfast Club detectives embark on a hunt to find out where, when, and how Clarissa Mayberry ate her fatal last meal. Initially thought to be an accidental death, some suspects are revealed, most with a reason to wish her dead. Can the detectives get to the bottom of this, or will the death remain a mystery? Bree, careful what you wish for. Oh my. It's on YouTube. Oh, good. I will. Uh, hey, Cajun. Sneak peek while I'm working. Highly recommend Myrtle Clover back to work. <laughs> Thanks for the pop-in. Uh, Mary says, hi, Cajun. Nice to see you this morning. It was a quick peek. Have a great week. Uh, we appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Be careful what you... Oh, I did. I pre-ordered this. Oh, I did because it's part of the grilled cheese mysteries. My mom reads this. <laughs> I haven't gotten into it yet. Uh, when a mean and quarrelsome woman is found murdered in her own home, most of the residents of Balsam Dell can only say feta late than never. <laughs> With the summer heat sizzling, grilled cheese restaurant owner Carly Hale is thrilled to have Ross Baxter delivering her sandwiches to local seniors. She's never met a more polite or hardworking working young man, and she brushes it brushes it off when one of her more difficult customers complains about him. But then Ross returns to the woman's home to make another delivery and finds her dead body. <clears throat> Excuse me. The police and half the town immediately suspect he's killed her, so Carly steps in to investigate, determined to prove them wrong. Carly soon learns that the victim had an estranged stepson and stepdaughter, both of whom needed her money to get their lives back on track. Worse still, in her younger days, the dead woman had a reputation for preying on other women's husbands, leaving broken marriages in her wake, and a list of suspects a mile long. But Ross's fingerprints were found on the murder weapon, leaving Carly hungry for any clues she can find, until she comes face to face with the killer and realizes this time she may have bitten off more than she can chew. Includes melt in your mouth sandwich recipes. Which is why I'm putting off reading it. The Poison Pen by Paige Selton, ninth in the Scottish, Scottish Bookshop Mysteries. Edinburgh is mourning recent. Is mourning recent the death. Okay, it's the syntax. The death of Queen Elizabeth II when bookseller Delaney Nichols' boss comes to her with a most unusual assignment. An old friend of his, living in a state in the village of Roslyn, has found what could be a priceless relic on her property, and Delaney is tasked with investigating. 
could Julie possibly have an item of breathtaking Scottish historical significance in her possession? But when Delaney arrives at Jolie's estate, she is greeted by a legal team with a vested interest in the property. Jolie manages to remove the interlopers, but as they're examining the priceless item, they hear a scream and meet a much less welcome discovery, a body. As Delaney digs deeper, she discovers Jolie's own fa fascinating history. Jolie's mother had, a long had long claimed that her daughter was the rightful heir to the throne, not Elizabeth II, because of an affair she claimed to have with King Edward VIII. That still would not put them to be the rightful heir. The only evidence, however, is the form of a purported journal that one of Edward's secretaries kept. The puzzles become more confusing when a connection is uncovered between this far-fetched story and the murdered man. Delaney will have to read between the lines to put together the pieces or become history herself. It would only be error if, because Edward VIII abdicated and his brother became king. So only if there was a brother in between those two would there be or a different heir. I don't understand. The Clock Struck by Betty Webb. One woman's trash is another woman's lost Chagall masterpiece. Expat Zoe Barlow has settled well into her, her artist life among the lost generation of 1920s Paris. When a too tipsy guest at her weekly poker game breaks Zoe's favorite clock, she's off to Montparnasse. We market to bargain with the vendor Lorette for a replacement. What Zoe didn't bargain for was the lost Chagall painting that's been used like a rag to wrap her purchase. Eager to learn what Lorette, whether Lorette has more Chagalls lying about like trash, Zoe sets off to track her down at her storage shed. shed. With no Lorette in sight, Zoe snoops around and indeed finds several additional Chagalls and then she finds Lorette herself, dead beneath a scrap heap, her beautiful face bashed in. With Paris hosting the 1924 Summer Olympics, the police are far too busy with tourist-related crimes to devote much time to the clock seller's murder. After returning the paintings to a grateful Marc Chagall, Zoe begins her own investigation, etc., etc. And that is all we have time for. Kim says, have a great day, everyone. You too, Kim. Can you send me your link? You can either put it in the uh, comments or you can email me there. All right. Hope you guys have a good Monday and check out the Eclipse safely. Won't look at it directly. Deborah says, bye y'all. Hope your day is great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good Monday. Read good books. I do not have sprints tonight on Monday. Um, don't know which of the crew is doing it. Is it Storm? And Storm Reads? Um, otherwise my sprints are tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. I do every Tuesday and Thursday evenings and Saturday afternoon. Tomorrow we'll be looking at, uh, well, mysteries and thrillers. It's stormy. Okay. It's storm reads. All right, guys. Well, as the banner says here, don't, <laughs> as the banner says the wrong words. Ah, uh, there it is. Don't be a bookworm, be a booking monster. Om nom nom. Have a good day. See you tomorrow. God bless.